How you doing? My name is Chris Axstrom. I'm here to talk to you today about the Garrett TPE 321 series of engine. Uh, purpose of this brief, we're going to familiarize you with some of the advantages and disadvantages of this particular family of turboprop engines. Quick overview of what we're going to go over. We're going to talk about the layout of the components of the engine, some of the uh, specific advantages and disadvantages of this engine being a uh, single shot turboprop. Talk about the history of the company as well as the engine and how it developed. Uh, we'll talk about the T76, which is the particular military variant of this type of engine. And I'll show you a slide of some planes it was used on, and we'll wrap it up. So basically, the layout is it's a single shaft turboprop engine. You've got uh, twin centrifugal compressors down here, 11.4 uh, to 1 pressure ratio. This feeds in through two different sets of diffusers into a reverse flow annular combustor um, with a special type of swirl technology on the uh, injectors. This engine was designed in the 50s, so special technology back then is like old school now, but I mean, uh, you know, you look back at the turbojets at the time, big plumes of black smoke at the back, not this one, it was kind of revolutionary at the time. Um, then that takes this compressed gas, sends it through a converging duct to a three-stage uh, uh, axial turbine. That takes pretty much the gas, turns it into high-speed, low-torque energy, sends this forward, it's all one shaft, so like we said, two-thirds of the energy is used to, to drive the uh, central people compressors, and the rest goes through the shaft to the gearbox, which turns that into lower speed, higher torque energy, and goes right to the prop. Um, now, because this is all one shaft going through there, it's kind of a unique uh, engine, actually. Uh, basically, what happens is you start this thing up, it goes to 70% power or whatever like that, and as a result, the engine, I mean, the prop is turning at 70%. You go to take off, you bring it up to 100%, that makes sense and the prop goes to 100%. So really you're not ever changing the speed of the prop. What you're doing, you have two sets of levers, power levers and RPM levers. The power levers change the pitch of the prop, make it take a bigger bite of air. That puts more uh, drag on the engine, so that it adds more gas at the back. So the engine is pretty much running at 97 to 100% of its full power all the time, which is kind of unique. As a result, this results in a couple of advantages. Instant power response, you don't have to worry for the engine to spool up. The power levers, power's right there. But it works in reverse too. You pull back the power levers, and those compressors form a lot of drag on the props. So it, they kind of work like speed brakes. You bring the power all the way back, the plane slows down and quick. There's stories of the uh, Rockwell Aero Commander, which was the first plane that had these installed. And basically, you could do an emergency descent at about 4,500 feet per minute and just hold 110 knots because it's like big speed brakes on the side there. Um, because it runs at 100%, to 97% all the time, it can be optimized to work right in that range all the time. So it's really efficient at cruise. And it had the power to get you up to cruise fast, and then obviously using that kind of speed brake technique to get you back down to the ground pretty fast. Um, we saw in the layout that it was kind of a straight through design. Um, there's no real reversals in this engine aside from just where the combustor is. So as a result, the air comes in, goes right back out, and that exhaust can be used as jet thrust. It adds about 70 horsepower per side, which is kind of a good marketing thing for this engine compared to its competitor, the PT-6. Um, and it's not really a statistic that's used very often, but this engine for turboprops has the best horsepower per pound of weight of the engine of any turboprop ever made. But uh, this came with some disadvantages. Um, because we you know, they had talked about the compressor drag, if you start to windmill the engine, uh, if you lost an engine, this was a really big deal, especially on a multi-engine plane because not just, you didn't just have the drag from the propeller, you also had the drag from the engine connected to it. So as a result, they had to build in these negative torque sensors, which basically, if the propeller detects that the engine has stopped putting out twisting force, it automatically goes to a feathered pitch to you know, not cause a huge amount of adverse drag. Um, as a result, the, um, it has these start locks, so it doesn't automatically go to a feathered position when you're starting it. It has to be absolutely flat, otherwise there's too much drag from the propeller when you're starting the thing. Um, if you didn't handle this engine right, you'd be damaged. As a matter of fact, if you change the RPM of it too fast, you could get a fire. So it had, was, you had to kind of babysit it, but when you got it right, working right and you knew how to handle it, it was a, very much a pilot's engine. Um, starting in cold weather, kind of hard. Obviously, you're using battery power most of the time, and it, you know the batteries are kind of low because of the uh, cold weather. It's hard to start it because you're starting everything in the engine at once, not just the gas generating portion. Um, and more maintenance was required. It was harder to get to the inside of this engine than it was for like a PT-6 that kind of broke part of the module that I could have in Jonathan's presentation about two weeks ago. Um, cooling. Cooling was an issue. Um, basically, startup and shutdown for this engine was a pretty uh, abrupt thing. You 
you shut down the engine and the drag from the propeller kind of made it shut down a little bit faster than let's say a PT6 which just could just kind of free windmill in there. As a result, it, it happened too abruptly, like if, the, uh, if it went to the feather position when you shut it down, those turbines would sit back there with no air going past them and they kind of cook a little bit. So there's stories of pilots running out of the airplane and having to like hand feather, the, not feather, but uh, hand windmill the propeller to force air through the engine. Um, and it was loud. On the ground, in certain airframes, this was known to be like one of the loudest turboprop engines like made. Um, doing my research, I found out that the ground crews have something called a Garrett salute, which is the one finger in each ear as the engine goes, as the plane goes by. Um, and I have a quick video to show you. I'm not going to blast your eardrums or anything like this, but this is what this guy sounds like starting out. This is a Lancer that they put one in. You can see the second the starter went, the prop started turning. going up to like 100% power right off the bat because that's where it runs. Um, Garrett as a company started in 1936 by John Cliff Garrett. Started in LA but moved it to Phoenix. They're right now on the north side of Firmway 826 there at Sky Harbor when the uh, firm of the building says Honeywell. Um, basically they started in the 30s and 40s doing turbine research for small turbine engines, APUs, lead systems for uh, bombers in World War II, turbochargers, superchargers, things of this uh, nature. Um, that put them kind of in an interesting position. They did a lot of research on these uh, centrifugal compressors. And uh, it, uh, these are all pictures of APUs they produced, but basically they kind of became famous for APUs and generator sets, as they called them. They, in the 80s, they became Allied Signal, and then in the 90s, they were bought up by Honeywell, and they're still Honeywell today. The TP331, though, uh, was designed in the late uh, 1950s, early 1960s. The idea was it was going to be a 400 shaft horsepower, 200 pound engine. It's 0.66 pounds per horsepower per engine, that was our, per hour <coughs> uh, fuel consumption. Um, basically started life as a generator set. The Army said we need this thing to power buildings in case of power failure. So they developed the uh, GTP331 for the Army. The Army paid a lot for that development. They didn't actually end up buying it, so Garrett was kind of left with this generator set they didn't have any use for. The Navy came along and had a requirement for an assault support helicopter, and uh, which eventually became the Bell UH-1 Huey. And uh, Garrett said, you know, we can adapt this generator set to be a turboshaft engine. Um, they did. And that didn't work so well because it's a single shaft engine. You would need a clutch to interface with the rotor blades. And that clutch was huge and heavy and required lots of maintenance, so that kind of flopped. But as a result, they have this now turboshaft engine. Well, finally, the Navy came along with a uh, counterinsurgency aircraft requirement, which eventually became the OV-10 Bronco. And they... Uh, Developed that into be a turboprop version for the turbo shaft. So they had a lot of development of this uh, engine paid for by government research along the way. <coughs> and uh, it grew and grew, keeping the same form factor. It was a pretty small engine um, up until the mid 80s. And eventually the Dash 14 model had that 1,660, sorry, 1,960 shaft horsepower, um, all while maintaining the size right over there. I should have mentioned that's my engine there. Um, so yeah, the T76, which is what the 331 became to be in the Bronco. Um, selected for the OV-10, Professor Carr used to fly one of these. Um, he talks about the engine being really, really reliable. Um, the only time you ever had a problem with it is calling in fire uh, airstrikes for about a three hour period and jockeying around the throttle a lot. It over a little bit, but other than that, he said it was really durable. Um, they had to build another version of it so it would be kind of rotating so there wouldn't be a critical engine on the uh, aircraft. Um, they inverted it. The, you can see the intakes are on the top there, but the, just like this one is, this is actually the T-76 we have over here. Um, normally though, the intake would be on the bottom. This is just for greater fog resistance, so you wouldn't be inject, ingesting rocks and things like this because it was designed to operate from unimproved strips. Um, a really great short field on takeoff performance. This thing, the aircraft carries a Tarwa class assault ship that the Marine Corps has. No catapults or anything like that. It normally operates helicopters and Harriers, but this thing can take off and land unaided on that thing. So. Here's some notable applications. This is the Cessna 441 Conquest, the MU2. This is the Fairchild Metroliner. Uh, Professor Raybach calls it the Kansas City sewer pipe. I'm not sure why. <laughs> but um, that's the BAE 41. That's one of its major uh, commercial airline uh, applications. And there's the CASA 212 that Professor Harry used to fly. 
Um, all right, in summary, we talked about the uh, layout and components of the engine, uh, some of the advantages and disadvantages of it being a single shaft <coughs> engine. Talked a little bit about the history of the company and the history of the development process of the engine. Talked about the uh, T76 in particular and uh, showed you a slide with some notable applications. In conclusion, um, you know, they produce more than 14,000 of these engines with like, I think it's like 150 different variants. Um, which, you know, it's been going for 50 years, they're still building these things. Um, it's a pretty significant small gas turbine engine of the 20th century. Um, there's some current applications of the thing. This is the Kestrel aircraft there. They've already had one with PT-6, but they've decided to switch it over to the uh, Garrett. They don't have a flying model yet, so there's a mock-up. And this is the MQ-9 uh, Reaper drone that they uh, fly in Afghanistan currently. And it's got the uh, Garrett on the back as well. Um, any questions? Yeah.